Oh, hello there, welcome. I'm just trawling through the archives to see what snippets I can discover of John Stott's amazing life. Now, let's just see what I've got to. Ah, oh, yes, it's the Hookses. It's his beloved rural retreat in the very far west of Wales. With its spectacular views out over the Atlantic coastline, and with God's glorious creation all around, it's no wonder it was one of his dearest places on earth. He never ceased to give thanks to God for it. So here, at his desk, this great man of God could read, study, pray and write without interruption. Around 50 books were written right here. The inspiration he derived from working at this desk was to immeasurably bless millions all round the world. It was to make him one of the best-loved figures in the worldwide church of his day. He called his tiny quarters his hermitage. They were separate from the main buildings, so he could be free from distraction from the various study groups staying there. But when time permitted, he loved to take the occasional break from his rigorous work schedule to pop up to join the guests for a short chat or even meal. Yeah. Yeah. I may mean, not encourage you. Have we got one spare portion? No, thank you very much indeed. You can't oh, regret it. That's you will, you will. He always delighted in the pleasure that the Hookses was giving to all, young and old alike. And while breakfast preparations continued inside, he even found time to attend to some household chores. The winding of the ship's clock was his exclusive responsibility. He was very attached to this clock and attended to its weekly care with an almost religious regularity, including helping it to catch up on any lost minutes. There, that should do nicely. Its master is satisfied. At other times, he enjoyed more household chores, especially in the company of young people. He greatly loved having them around and took great interest in their lives. Another Hooks' feature was the weekly barbecue prepared just outside his little hermitage. How he enjoyed relaxing with his guests after his strenuous studies and writing. Pineapple, we did your tomato, lovely. Azalea bed. Delicious. And how he loved leading everyone in a new grace. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. And for the blood he shed. And for the blood he shed. We thank you for his risen life. We thank you for his risen life. Life. And for our daily bread. And for our daily bread. One of his great relaxations was to entertain his guests by his reading aloud of his favourite Saki stories, as we shall see. Okay, this is called the Storyteller. It was a hot afternoon and the railway carriage was correspondingly sultry and the next stop was a temple coom nearly an hour ahead. The occupants of the carriage were a small girl and a smaller girl and a small boy. An aunt belonging to the children occupied one corner seat and the further corner seat on the opposite side was occupied by a bachelor who was a stranger to their party. But the small girls and the small boy emphatically <laughs> occupied the compartment. Both the aunt and the children were conversational in a limited, persistent way, reminding one of the attentions of a housefly that refused to be discouraged. <laughs> Most of the aunt's remarks seemed to begin with, Don't! <laughs> and nearly all of the children's remarks began with, Why? <laughs> the bachelor said nothing out loud. Don't, Cyril, don't, exclaimed the aunt, 
as the small boy began smacking the cushions of the seat, producing a cloud of dust at each blow. <laughs> Come and look out of the window, she added. The child moved reluctantly to the window. Why are those sheep being driven out of that field, he asked. <laughs> I expect they're being driven to another field where there is more grass, said the aunt weakly. But there is lots of grass in that field, protested the boy. There's nothing else but grass there. Aunt, there's lots of grass in that field. Well, perhaps the grass in the other field is better, suggested the aunt fatuously. Why is it better, came the swift, inevitable question. Oh, look at those cows, exclaimed the aunt. Now, nearly every field along the line had contained cows or bullocks but she spoke as though she were drawing attention to a rarity. Why is the grass in the other field better? persisted Cyril. The frown on the bachelor's face was deepening to a scowl. He was a hard, unsympathetic man, the aunt decided in her mind. She was utterly unable to come to any satisfactory decision about the grass in the other field. The smaller girl created a diversion by beginning to recite On the Road to Mandalay. She only knew the first line, but she put her limited knowledge to the fullest possible use. She repeated the line over and over and over again in a dreamy but resolute and very audible voice. It seemed to the bachelors, though somebody had bet with her, that she couldn't repeat the, loud, the line aloud 2,000 times without stopping. Whoever it was who made the wager was likely to lose his bet. Come over here and listen to a story, said the aunt, when the bachelor had looked twice at her and once at the communication cord. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the children know that. No, what's it called now? The emergency something. Yes. Mm. Emergency cord. Mm. Stop the train. The children moved listlessly towards the aunt's end of the carriage. Evidently, her reputation as a storyteller did not rank high in their estimation. In a low, confidential voice, interrupted at frequent intervals by loud, petulant questions from her listeners, the aunt began an unenterprising and deplorably uninteresting story about a little girl who was good. And she made... <laughs> she, <laughs> She made friends with everybody on account of her goodness and she was finally saved from a mad bull by a number of rescuers who admired her moral character. <laughs> Wouldn't they have saved her if she hadn't been good, demanded the bigger of the small girls. It was exactly the question that the bachelor had wanted to ask. Well, yes. Uh, the aunt said lamely, but I don't think they would have run quite so fast to her help if they had not liked her so much. <laughs> it's the stupidest story I've ever heard, said the bigger of the small girls, with immense conviction. I didn't listen after the first bit, it was so stupid, said Cyril. <laughs> the smaller girl made no actual comment on the story, but she'd long ago recommenced a murmured repetition of her favourite line. You don't seem to be a success as a storyteller, said the bachelor suddenly from his corner. The aunt bristled in instant defense at this unexpected attack. It's a very difficult thing to tell stories that children can both understand and appreciate, she said stiffly. I don't agree with you, said the bachelor. Perhaps you would like to tell them a story, was the aunt's retort. Tell us a story, demanded the bigger of the small girls. Once upon a time, began the bachelor, there was a little girl called Bertha, who was extraordinarily good. <laughs> the children's momentarily aroused interest began at once to flicker. All stories seemed dreadfully alike, no matter who told them. She did all she was told, she was always truthful, she kept her clothes clean, she ate milk puddings as though they were jam tarts, she learned her lessons perfectly, and she was polite in her manners. Was she pretty? asked the bigger of the small girls. Well, not as pretty as any of you, said the bachelor, but she was horribly good. <laughs> there was a wave of reaction in favour of the story. 
The word horrible in connection with goodness was a novelty that commended itself. It seemed to introduce a ring of truth that was absent from the aunt's tales of infant life. She was so good, continued the bachelor, that she won several medals for goodness, which she always wore <laughs> pinned onto her dress. There was a medal for obedience and another medal for punctuality and a third medal for good behaviour. They were large metal medals and they clicked against one another as she walked. No other child in the town where she lived had as many as three medals, so everybody knew she must be an extra good child. <laughs> Horribly good, quoted Cyril. Everybody talked about her goodness and the prince of the country got to hear about it and he said that as she was so very good she might be allowed once a week to walk in his park which was just outside the town. It was a beautiful park and no children were ever allowed in it so it was a great honour for Bertha to be allowed to go there. Were there any sheep in the park? demanded Sybil. <laughs> no, said the bachelor, there were no sheep. Why weren't there any sheep? came the inevitable question arising out of that answer. The aunt permitted herself a smile, which might almost have been described as a grin. There were no sheep in the park, said the bachelor, because the prince's mother had once had a dream that her son would either be killed by a sheep or else by a clock falling on him. For that reason, the, pr the prince never kept a sheep in his park or a clock in his palace. The aunt suppressed a gasp of admiration. Was the prince killed by a sheep or by a clock? asked Cyril. Well, he's still alive, so we can't tell whether the dream will come true, said the bachelor unconcernedly. Anyway, there were no sheep in the park, but there were lots of little pigs running all over the place. What colour were they? They were black with white faces, white with black spots, black all over, grey with white patches, and some were white all over. The storyteller paused still had a full idea of the park's treasures sink into the children's imaginations. Then he resumed. Bertha was rather sorry to find that there were no flowers in the park. She promised her aunts, with tears in her eyes, that she would not pick any of the kind prince's flowers, and she'd meant to keep her promise. So, of course, it made her feel silly to find that there were no flowers to pick. <laughs> Why weren't there any flowers? Because the pigs had eaten them all, said the bachelor promptly. <laughs> the gardener had told the prince that you couldn't have pigs and flowers, so he decided to have pigs and no flowers. <laughs> there, was <a> m <laughs> there was a murmur of approval at the excellence of the prince's decision. So many people would have decided the other way. There were lots of other delightful things in the park. There were ponds with gold and blue and green fish in them, and trees with beautiful parrots that said clever things at a moment's notice, and hummingbirds that hummed all the popular tunes of the day. <laughs> Bertha walked up and down and enjoyed herself immensely, and she thought to herself, if I were not so extraordinarily good, I should not have been allowed to come into this beautiful park and enjoy all that there is to be seen in it. And her three medals clinked against <laughs> one another as she walked and helped to remind her how very good she really was. <laughs> but just then, an enormous wolf Whoa. came prowling into the park to see if it could catch a fat little pig for its supper. <laughs> what colour was it? asked the children with an immediate quickening of interest. It was mud colour all over with a black tongue and pale grey eyes that gleamed with unspeakable ferocity. And the first thing it saw in the park was Bertha. A <laughs> pinafore was so spotlessly clean and white that it could be seen from a great distance. Bertha saw the wolf and saw it was stealing towards her. And she began to wish that she'd never been allowed to come into the park. She ran as hard as she could and the wolf came after with huge mm. leaps and bounds. She managed to reach a shrubbery of myrtle bushes where she hid herself in one of the thickest of the bushes. The wolf came sniffing among the branches, his black tongue lolling out of his mouth and its pale grey eyes gleaming with rage. Bertha was terribly frightened and thought to herself, if I'd not been so extraordinarily good, I should have been safe in the town at this very moment. <laughs> However, 
The scent of the myrtle was so strong that the wolf couldn't sniff out where Bertha was hiding, and the bushes were so thick that he might have hunted in them for a long time without catching sight of her. So he thought he might as well go off and catch a little pig instead. <laughs> Bertha was trembling very much at having the wolf prowling and sniffing so near her, and as she trembled, the medal for obedience clinked against the medals for good conduct and punctuality. The wolf was just moving away when he heard the sound of the medals clinking and stopped to listen. They clinked again in a bush quite near him. He dashed into the bush, his pale grey eyes gleaming with ferocity and triumph, and dragged Bertha out and devoured her to the last morsel. Oh. And all that was left of her were her shoes, bits of clothing, and the three medals for goodness. <laughs> were any of the little pigs killed? No, they all escaped. The story began badly, said the smaller of the small girls, but it had a beautiful ending. It's the most beautiful story I've ever heard, said the bigger of the small girls with immense decision. It's the only beautiful story that I've ever heard, said Cyril. The dissentient opinion came from the aunts. A most improper story to tell to young children. You've undermined the effect of years of careful teaching. Well, at any rate, said the bachelor, collecting his belongings preparatory to leaving the carriage, I kept them quiet for ten minutes, which was more than you were able to do. <laughs> Unhappy woman, he observed to himself as he walked down the platform at Templecombe Station, for the next six months or so, those children will assail her in public with demands for an improper story. <laughs> Horribly good. Horribly good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope you've enjoyed this glimpse of Uncle John at the Hookses. And who knows what other little clips of him may be hidden away somewhere. If you find any, do let us know. I'm sure all his friends would love to see them. The contact details are on the website.